Now, Device has returned to Astralis. Not really a surprise in the sense that this has been on the move on everyone's lips for a long time. Most of this year, it's been repeatedly reported by Jackson that this trade was in the works, trying to happen. Seems like both parties wanted it to happen. In fact, all three parties, Device, Nip and Astralis, all wanted it to happen as long as the price was right. Now, it is worth pointing out, he hasn't necessarily returned to competitive play because, first of all, they're not in the major. And also, Astralis didn't make it to the last four finals. Therefore, they also quite, I don't think they can qualify to the global finals. I'm not quite sure how that I'm pretty sure he got so basically the year's done for device anyway and also there was a an article or interview done on the Danish TV2 website which is obviously a TV channel it's on that pimp does the bigger ESL events for I'll probably do the major for I'm guessing this time around it's obviously in Danish but if, it's if you read the translation I'm not going to get it for you now you can go get it yourself I'm not your butler then basically you can see that he says something along the lines of like saying it would like be a lie to say he's like got over his problems that were the issues causing him to basically be out all this time that he just sort of like hopes he can and that he's got some techniques now to work with it and it actually makes it sound like maybe that's also part of the timing of him coming back now is that he doesn't have to play immediately and he hasn't necessarily resolved his issues hence maybe why he wasn't playing in an IP so to me this obviously completes the speculation and all the back and forth and the drama and it was the most obvious direction for him to go in his career in light of what happened in NIP and some of the personal things that were shaded into that move and obviously it's been a very serious rumour slash basically set of reports since the last major I mean I myself reported that I'd heard from a very legit source that Valde and Device would be going to Astralis it was actually behind the scenes that that's who Astralis wanted I've heard the, the Device moves obviously taken longer because no one knew if he's come back to play and he cost more and the Valde one I've heard like Astralis just didn't want to pay the buyout basically or she was asking for too much also maybe Maybe Valde thought he could get into EG. There was all sorts of drama going on at that point in time. Now, let's be real. It is great to see one of the best to ever do it return to competitive play, potentially. You never want the great players out of the game until they choose to leave. Even when someone's totally washed, I actually don't want them to leave the game. I'm not the guy who's like, you're ruining your legacy. I don't think you do ruin your legacy that way. You won't be remembered quite the same way, maybe, in the short term or when you retire, if you play badly at the end and you're sort of a bit washed like the Freibergs of the world in Dignitas. But you'll still be remembered for the great things you did. And by the way, as time goes on, they'll forget the end of your career and they'll just focus on the best time period. Like when people say that thing of like, ah, Michael John should never come back to the Wizards. I thought it was brilliant that he came back to the Wizards. It actually showed me what he could do with his skill set at age 39, at age 40. By the way, for that age, he's probably the best 39 or 40 year old to ever play basketball. He was really, really good still. He wasn't the best in the whole world. He wasn't the best in the league or an MVP. But you go look relative to his age, it's absurd how good he was. And he was still hitting game winners, dropping 40 on people. I mean, the, the guy was just a stud still. One of the best mid-range players ever, even at that age. Just showed people couldn't stop the guy. So I'm not one of those guys who thinks like, oh, just let the new generation come in. No, let the new generation force that guy out. Let them beat that guy and then see if he can get pushed out of the scene. As long as someone's offering him a contract and he wants to play, then let the legend stay around. I don't think you ever bury a legend until they decide that they're done, basically. So to me... I also think you can't replace the true legends and the great players. Like, look, think of this. Kenny S was the French Harper for so long, right? Does Zewu coming along and being an amazing Harper, maybe even better? Does that mean we don't need Kenny S? No, it means, if anything, you think, oh, imagine if we had Zewu and Kenny S. That would be so sick in the same scene at the same time, battling each other. Wouldn't that be the best? Wouldn't it be even cooler for Zewu to take that crown by going head-to-head -head with Kenny S year after year after year? And they're both trying their hardest and they're both in top teams. They could have even both been in Vitality and to all these years going back and forth on land wouldn't that have been so fun but we don't get to have it Zebu came along pretty much when Kenny S was starting to die out the online era came and basically gets it for Kenny S right no one really cares anymore but I tell you what it's sad wouldn't you love to see Kenny S playing on a game of Legion or a Sprout and still kicking around these RMRs and having the occasional performance or doing what Oscar did when he was playing with those guys um, last year, wouldn't you wouldn't you love to see him in tier two still doing some cool things and showing some performances here and there? Obviously, it was Sinners was the team Oscar was playing with. So this video isn't about device returning to Astralis specifically, and like, you know, what's it gonna be like for Astralis and you should they kick and what that mean? And what did Astralis lie about that? No, it's actually about questioning what happened with NIP. 
Because it isn't as simple, by the way, as just taking like a sticking plaster and going to uh, mental health and stick that over and go, no questions, please, no questions, please. Please be respectful of how I'm feeling. Like, no questions ever again. I can stay out infinite amount of time. I can waste infinite amount of dollars. I can waste my teammates' time, the fans' time, the orgs' time. No one is allowed answers. I don't have to answer anything. I can just sit out. Oh, oh I still want all my money and all that. Yeah, and the contract. I'll stay. Yeah, oh, the, no, no, the, no, it can't be that way. That is not the way it is allowed to work in this particular game. So the question question I have first and foremost is this, why is he in Astralis now? No, no, not does he want to be in Astralis? Would he rather be in Astralis? Did he want to move back to Denmark? Did it not work out with his girlfriend? Did he not like the way it was? No, that's irrelevant. The question is this, if it was a mental health problem mixed with potentially physical problems here that he's sort of implying, is it the case that that was what was stopping Device playing for NIP even recently? Because if so, does that mean joining Astralis cures those problems? That doesn't seem plausible, guys. Why was he not finishing out his contract in NIP? If it's the case that he can't come back fully and he's working his way back in and maybe he could have played the odd game here and there. They weren't even a, a top team until Alexi B came and joined the squad. When they didn't even have Brawl and they were headed probably on the downward curve. But he could never play for those guys in a, like a 10-month period. He couldn't even play one map. So now... He's going to Astralis. By the way, if you're really not going to play in Astralis for the rest of this year, and the rest, of, I'd even make that explicit. Like, surely you want to set fair expectations for the fans. That's why this whole thing just doesn't sit right with me. So let's just go back in time. Device left Astralis. It was in like late April of 2021. Now, to be fair, the team had tanked in online play in early 2021. They'd had like four straight tournaments. They didn't finish top four in the online era, which is wild. Because if you remember, once they got Zipnix and Glaive back, they'd actually been very good to end 2020. And they'd even started the year with, they'd been winning tournaments to start the year, coming second to Na'Vi at Blast Global. I suspect it's because everyone within Astralis was assessing their options and what they were going to do at the end of their contracts, which most of them were going to run out at the end of 2021. It was even implied when Casper did let Device go that they could have let his contract run out. So it sounds like a bunch of them, they were going to end the contracts at the end of 2021. So what I think was happening was Zipnix and Glaive, remember, had been out the previous year, forced their way out with burnout. Then they'd returned. They'd even been able to win Pro League with Glaive coming back. It was implied, by the way, those players and many of these players could have gone elsewhere. Like, I'll just tell you, based on the stories I've heard, which are pretty legit from a bunch of sources, Zipnix would have been in that Cloud9 lineup of Henry G if they'd have just said yes to his outrageous salary demands. Obviously, at the end of 2021... Dupree, Magus, Gonzalez did end up leaving as a package deal. Could have been to a complexity, could have been to another sort of squad, could have been to an American team even maybe. But they ended up going to Vitality is the big power move that Vitality made. So I suspect that there was some bullshit with the actual transfer itself to Nip. Like, we'll get to it in a second, but there are reasons why it doesn't seem like he actually tested the market. It was like, this is the team I think we're the best team to join. It seems like there was other reasons he did. But obviously, when he joined and it was reported like a million dollars or euros or whatever, first of all, it seems like it was more like 600k or 750k euros. It doesn't quite frankly seem like it was even on the face value of like, Nip's got all this money to spend because obviously Nip, it was implied that they, remember, they later like partnered with that like Chinese org or whatever and had like the whole thing where they like floated on the stock market or some bullshit, right? So basically, Richard had an angle where he said he thought maybe like this new agency that somehow were representing device, maybe that was like their move to get into esports was they were going to pay part of this buyout themselves. It now appears, based on later reports, that apparently device himself paid some of the buyout, apparently 130,000 euros, which to be fair, it's not like he got a big sack of money. He just basically was owed sticker money and passed salary or prize winnings and just sort of said, keep the 130, that's the rest of my buyout. And it allowed him to leave. Because here's the key thing. As far as I know, and I've got some pretty good sources across the scene for this, including very close to Device, the real reason he left Astralis specifically for Nip and went straight to Nip is because of his girlfriend. His girlfriend was a Swedish influencer in gaming called Amelia Holt. A lot of you will know her. And Device had been with her for a while, I think like a year or two at this point in time. And he moved to Sweden, specifically to Nip. So he could be closer to her and live with her. I think he already, well, here's the thing. He actually already lived in Stockholm anyway, as far as I know. It's just that he moved to a team there so he didn't have to keep traveling to Denmark or Copenhagen, presumably, and all that sort of jazz with the Danish angle so he could be maybe closer at home. Now, it was sort of intimated. This part's never been made explicit, obviously, that because it didn't work out, I think something, I added something like a month after he joined NIP that the relationship just broke apart and didn't work out. I won't go into the reasons why. I don't even know if they're out there as rumors, but it's none of your business. But what I'll say is this. It is there for 
to be inferred that he maybe did this move, not just because he wanted to be with her more full time and not travel, but maybe the relationship's having some problems. Maybe that gets cited as a reason when you're always out of town. Or something. And so what you do is you think, right, well, I'll fix that angle then. Let's give it one last full try to this. Let's go all in. Let's see if I can rescue this thing. Okay. This isn't a drama show. This isn't a soap opera show. I won't really speculate whether that's the right move or not. I don't know these people. I, I don't know what their relationship was like. I don't know if that's a silly move and people are going to go, hey, he got cucked. I don't know if it's that, that was the right move and maybe it could have saved something that was very special to him at the time, even maybe meant more than Counter Strikes as we were just playing online at the time. We hadn't had the lands again. Really, it's not really any of our business. And quite frankly, I think speculation would be almost entirely baseless on that. Like, I know a few things about Device. I've heard a few things about her, but again, I don't really know that this is the place for that. So to me, that whole buyout angle, that's why him spending 130k becomes even more ominous, right? It seems like he was just willing to do anything to try and make sure he was in Sweden and could make this relationship work. It didn't. Apparently, a month later, it, it didn't work out. And I will say, if you ever go back and look, in the early period, Device is playing really well out the gate. Then his numbers do start to drop, presumably when maybe he was upset about this or didn't feel as good in his life in general. By the way, if stress causes problems with his physical and his mental health, then maybe this could even be a factor as to why his play dropped off. Because obviously in NIP, he was still a good player, but he was dropping and dropping and dropping, and he wasn't going to be a top 10 player that year. That wasn't a reasonable expectation, really. Like, by the time he got to the end of the year, yeah, his level had dropped, and he was just a pretty good player. He wasn't some elite star, superstar player that they bought him to be. He wasn't a Cristiano Ronaldo that they tried to make him. Now, if you know me, you'll know I hate single-factor analysis. So it doesn't mean that's the only reason he moved there or that all the rest are lies somehow. I don't think he did lie about the other reasons. I could easily see how he might have imagined the Astralis Org had plateaued and maybe he didn't like some of the executives there because they brought in Casper Hid and he burned them all out. And then he tried all that silly nonsense with seven-man and ten-man lineups and all these silly statements. And then basically, like, implying, like, the players are on board with this stuff. Meanwhile, if you don't know this, when the players are interviewed or and go on shows and people even infer this well if you don't know Richard revealed that in their contracts they had a clause basically prohibiting them speak out in any way against the Orcs or they were in a position where they could go oh, it's not true well, I disagree with that they had to just basically tore the line up smile and just nod and say nothing and that's what they all seem to do now quite frankly maybe NIP seemed like a fresh org in this sense you think you passed all the old bullshit of NIP because they say it's newer people even though the Hitchum guy was secretly there apparently like years and years earlier when a lot of the bullshit the nothing in PayPal stuff was going on. So I could easily see also why you think, right, change of org, young players, up and coming guys who have a fresh mindset, I could have a big influence on them, new coach with a really good reputation and threat, tactical guy, he can be a good replacement for Zonic in that sense, he'll know how to use me, he'll love having an opera like me. I could see how all these things seem favourable, along with whatever was going on in his personal life and wanting to kind of be in Sweden more than having to travel to Denmark. And also, let's be real, just historically, and in terms of Counter-Strike, like, royalty, not only is NIP a legendary Swedish org, but when a, when a Swedish org, like, I know it's not a Swedish org, uh, well, that one is a Swedish org, but I know, like, for, like, for example, isn't a Swedish org, it's technically like a UK slash Australian org, but just famously always had a Swedish CS team. When one of these orgs has a Swedish team, and they bring in foreigners. Look, the Fnatic one now is different because they were sort of beggars can't be choosers type scenario. The Nip one, they absolutely could have just kept rolling with the Swedish lineup. They could have made big bids for the Crimsons and the Brawns of the world back then. They didn't. Instead, they're bringing in a big-name Danish player to play in a legendary Swedish org. That's actually a pretty big sort of PR statement. That's a pretty big kind of like tick on your resume. Like, hey, you must have been a big deal if you broke them speaking Swedish. And as you see now, essentially they've never gone back, right? I mean, technically he could speak Swedish anyway, but you get the premise. Like they're, they're willing to give up something to get you because you're that good. That's a big deal. By the way, people like Real, Neo, some of these guys back in the day wanted those opportunities potentially to go to a Fnatic back in 1.6. Obviously, Trace himself, basically the... 1.6 version of device did actually go to SK Gaming when well, it was like early 2012 before he went again to Fnatic over later on. Now, for NIP, this is obviously a great move to get device. It's actually the best possible move I could think of that was available at the time. Bearing in mind, he even in theory could speak Swedish, right? So you can't really get a better player at this point in time. And he's an opera. Like, those are the players that are the most, like, kind of dry on the ground. Unless you were getting Glaive himself, there's no one else even really comparable as a piece that you could have gotten at this point in time. And obviously, I don't think he can speak Swedish or he wouldn't be good doing it as the IGL. So actually, Device is the most eligible possible, not free agent, but player that you could acquire on the transfer market. The next best would have been getting Brolan. 
Which, by the way, they did do this year. It's just they did it too late to ever have the two of them play in the lineup together, which is one of the great what ifs. Like, imagine the lineup now with Alexi B and Brawler if they had devices there or upper. Like, boys, that lineup could compete for the absolute top and maybe win the major. So he left active play in late 2021. Now, it was on December 4th, he did a tweet where he said he was going through a rough patch. This is before they played Team Liquid at IEM Winter in like the lower bracket of the group. That was the second to last event of the year for NIP. They still had the Blast Global Finals coming up. On December 10th, six days later, it was NIP, not Device, that announced publicly that oh, he needed time to recover and that he was ill and they were going like, to work to get him back into the lineup. Like They basically said, Device has been feeling unwell for the past day and has been advised by the doctor to rest and recover. PCR tests showed negative, which is great, but in order to to get him the time he needs to recover will field a substitute in Saturday's game versus G2. Now, when they're saying game versus G2, right, he never played another official map of play for NIP. He didn't even sign with Astralis until very recently, the 27th of October. The team played G2 in the semi-finals of this LAN, IEM Winter, the next day, and won and went to the final, I think, with Fawzi as his replacement, but lost to Vitality and got 3-0 swept in the final, which is how Vitality won a tournament at the end of the year. That means Nip had a real chance to win a LAN title that year with Device, potentially, if he'd have played. And obviously, this was an event, famously, that Na'Vi skipped when they were winning all the events. So it was a real wide-open chance to do one big thing, maybe at the end of your time with an IP, but whatever. He had his reasons. He could couldn't play, he was ill, they didn't win, he didn't play it, but then he didn't ever play again. Now, it was reported not long after this by 1PV, the French guys that Nell works for, that he was looking to go to Astralis. He wanted to leave Nip and go to Astralis. Device himself came out and said this was nonsense. Like he said, my mental health has taken a hammering this year for both personal reasons, I think what he could be implying, and the pressure that comes with playing professional esports. NIP and my teammates have been very understanding in letting me work on my mental well-being for the, re for the end of the year. Quite crucial, for the end of the year. End up being almost a year, mate. Then he says... I have been taking active steps toward recovery and I'm looking forward to putting in the work that will enable me to get back to the top of my game and be the best version of myself. All of these nonsense reports of me leaving the team are exactly that, nonsense. Now, what's interesting is... About a month later, on the 20th of January, he then did a tweet where he goes, currently working towards a safe return, but looking forward to getting back. Go ninjas. The next tweet on his Twitter is nine months plus later, him joining Astralis and returning. So he said, I'm currently working towards a safe return, looking forward to getting back. Now, here's the problem. I would, if this was by the numbers, make the joke like, well, technically he was, and he did look forward to getting back to Astralis. But the problem is because he put prayer hands, obviously it's actually supposed to be a high five emoji, but we all know that got wrecked by colloquialism and he put hashtag go ninjas that implies to play for NIP he never played into the map ever in his career for them guys, now the rumour around the PGL major, so we're talking like spring period now, was like I said that Valde and Device, complete uh, Astralis, they have another chance to go, nothing happened since then, then you had Jackson for months and months, as far as I know, accurately reporting that he was trying to return he was going to return, Astralis wanted him to return NIP maybe wanted to sell him, if it was for the right price, but what was the price, and it was all going up and down, and then there was another mystery other buyer no so we've never had any inference as to who that other buyer was, by the way. I suspect, just going to put this out there, that was even potentially some nonsense that Astralis themselves put out there in the media. Because, by the way, they're good at seeding certain journalists with information. I suspect they put that out there themselves to make their fans not go mental. Like, why aren't you just paying whatever it takes for a device? Like, well, you know, we've got like a bidding war going on and someone else is bidding. And, oh, you know, like there's another potential person. That's why it wasn't even like, oh, he has to go to Astralis. He's really prioritizing his priority. Like, give me a break. Mate. You can't trust anything Astralis says. Like the joke is, how do you know an Astralis exec's lying? His lips are moving. Give me a fucking break. So then he signs now, right after that whole config drama, right after all that nonsense where configs had his can his like contract like cancelled by mutual agreement. By the way, that could even be like small payout now. You get the fuck out. We don't kick you so you're not disgraced, but we free up the rest of the salary for what would have been, you know, the rest of the year, maybe another year after that. And with that money freed up, ah, we've got the extra 100k, the extra 200k we need to buy a device. And you know what? Since we're not the major, since we're not a blast that's going to be on home turf, we really need a PR win. Wait a minute, we don't have to actually play CSGO, but our greatest ever legend wants to return, could return now whether he needs to play or not, mainly if he doesn't. 
and we can sell all the jerseys, hype the team, make it seem like we're working something to next year. It'll even offset all that criticism. Is it? This is just too good a PR play, guys. It's a great PR play all around. Now, the key topic here is obviously the mental health angle, isn't it? It's a very, very tricky topic because you can't know to what degree he's affected by this. You can't know, is it the worst thing ever? Is it just a minor thing that occasionally affects him? Device, remember, and this is a key thing you've got to share, in, has had physical health issues previously, which, by the way, I can tell you right now, would have made some of the players quit for many months, and I think some would even just straight up retire if they had these issues. I mean, he basically had that thing with, like, his digestive system, a bit like what Get Right has, where you're just getting wrecked by it all the time when you eat food and you're at events. Supposedly, it's affected by stress, and, like, playing on stage would affect you, and being nervous. Oh, there's... A and this guy, by the way, was having this the whole time, like Get Right in CS Go during some of his key years when they were both at their peak at different time periods. And when he was winning everything with Astralis and getting all those MVP, he had these issues, as far as we know, because it began before the Megas lineup. So just like Get Right, what a legend to keep not only doing well, but winning and being your absolute peak level with those problems. That is legendary. That's why I'm always willing to give this guy the time of day and to give him the benefit of the doubt. And I also heard, this is the first time you're going to hear it anywhere, I heard from a legit source, he was having panic attacks like he was actually having real things where you just get really up you can see why this would make you not want to play professionally you can see why you'd want to make sure you had the right team potentially to come back for yeah i get all that my issue is why did he never play for nip again that is my problem think about this if he can't play at all then it sounds very serious and actually, maybe considering retirement would be an appropriate action. And if it's really lasting months and months and months with no true progress where you can never even play like an online game, then maybe it's time to actually come to the org and go, look, thanks for waiting this long, but let's cancel my contract, actually. Like, maybe I need some time off. Maybe I need to go away. I need to work on my health, get away from the computer. I need to figure out, actually, do I even want to be a pro? And if I have some of these ongoing issues, can I even be a pro? I would say that would be the good faith move. I don't know what conversations he had with Nip, but I wonder, did they really keep... I mean, obviously, they might want to sell him and might tell him, don't do that, you know, stay just on the bench and we'll sell you for the right amount. Or, you know, Astralis wants you back. Yeah, there's all, there's all sorts of stuff behind the scenes could have been going on. Here's the question, though. If he can play now and was just recovering on the NIP dime, as it were, then why can't he just play out the rest of his deal with Nips? This is nothing to play for anyway on the side of Astralis. Why couldn't he just play a few months with the Alexi B lineup or the Brawland lineup and just give it a go and show that his game's coming back? By the way, potentially even raise sort of the transfer value if you wanted to go back anyway. Why can't that happen? Now, I do think if you think about it, Look, the team before the Alexi Beal wasn't going to be elite. They were just a good team or an all right team. He obviously had the girlfriend situation, which might have soured him a little bit to wanting to play for a team in Sweden or an IP specifically or making him a bad memory. Yeah, look, that does make it, by the way. It also seemed like once that failed, maybe he was just like, ah, you know, fuck an IP. I don't really feel like being here. It's not really the game. Oh, Charles, I'd rather be back there. Yeah, that's the problem. We have to draw these things into question. Because, the, by the way, he never mentioned any of those reasons like the girlfriend stuff when he moved there. He made it sound like he was going because there's a team and exciting opportunity. And you saw the video like mm, five steps ahead and we can have an era and uh, you know all that just got lucky with timings you know everyone knows the memory and all the stuff but because he wasn't honest in the in the opening stanza guess what it means you can now call into question everything he has said since because he has not been honest one of the best things about telling the truth is that then you can actually look at the person telling the truth and go, you have credibility. I can potentially believe something else you say. What's that Nietzsche line? Something like, I'm not mad that you lied to me. I'm not that, mad that now I can ever trust you again or something along those lines, right? So people make it sound, and he maybe even inferred it himself, or like, don't speculate about this nonsense. By the way, you did go to Australia and told me. Maybe they hadn't got the deal done then, but what, you weren't even talking to them about potentially going back. Hadn't even entered your mind. You never even had discussions. You wouldn't ever talk to any player, which could be where they're getting this information. That just sounds a little bit like the conflict. Like, these are mostly, but yes, like, ah, oh, mostly. What do mostly and nonsense mean, device and conflict? I'd love to know at this point in time. Because when the people want to make it sound like, you're invading my life, like, hey, I need privacy, like, I'm a human being. Yeah, you are, you know what? This isn't about the human being, this is about the professional player. Device was being paid a big salary, He'd been bought out for a massive amount of money and was brought in to be the centerpiece of a potential dynasty for NIP. They even got Essa Tag while he was there. They got Brolan later. These would all be great pieces to potentially make you want to come back, stay playing, stay motivated. 
We even had that tweet, remember, when they got Brawl and there was a deleted tweet by Hitcham Shaheen, like the CEO or owner or whatever, a nip, where he basically said something like, the lineup will be fire when Deve or Device comes back. But he quickly deleted that because someone probably told me, you idiot, we haven't got Bleed Device, you might never play again. So we even had the implication that they were even building the team for him. You know, he had all those Hampus comments, though. They go the other direction, don't they? Remember, I think it was around the last major or just after, where he was just sort of saying, like, I think this is the lineup that we like the best or should stick with or whatever. Which, just to me, by the way, if you know how much the NIP or also has like their players balls in a fucking vice like Astralis that implies to me by the way that was even the soft way of being allowed to tell the fans like don't get your hopes up device ain't coming back bro this is the lineup just if you like nip this is it just cheer for us now because it ain't getting better so I even got that sense myself or that even the play because all I'll say is those players themselves can't say shit from nip so I am so busy find it so bizarre well I say it's so bizarre. I don't find it that bizarre. They went on certain podcasts. They're the ones where they just ask the softballs and they don't really ask the proper questions and they let you get away with any old shite and say whatever you want. So actually, not really surprising. It's a good way to like distract people with a little bit of fucking misdirection in it. Now, people, here's the key thing. Think how many times you've seen pro players complain about orgs treating them just like objects, just commodities, just cattle, just only caring about their value in terms of money, not respecting them as human beings, their dreams, their ambitions. What about what I'm trying to do in my career? This, you're cutting me short my young career. Well, you know what? What about pro players wasting millions of dollars and euros of an orgs money? What about a pro, a, an org? buying a player and this being the centerpiece of your best opportunity to build another dynasty in Counter-Strike and you even bringing in other pieces and parts and you keep they keep getting the vibe from this guy I don't know what he told them but the public communication was like I'm coming back soon guys I'm just working on the end of the year I'm going to try and recover new opportunities in 2022 I'm working to get back in January radio silence radio silence radio silence oh it's October I'm back home in, in Australis Back home in Australia. Like, what is that? What is that? Like, look, this could all privately have gone, but then you made plenty of public statements too. If you make the public statements, by the way, then certainly a fan could be like, well, what's the update now? Like, well, what's going, did that thing ever come out to play? Excuse me, excuse me, privacy. I, I, that's just an inappropriate thing to discuss. It ain't, you, you opened that door. Just like you opened the door on some of the other topics as well, didn't you? Even saying the personal reasons angle, look, I know that can be the biggest blanket vague statement of all time but we all know what it's inferring isn't it it's pretty obvious and by the way what about his teammates do they not carry at all for this as well didn't they deserve i don't know if he did talk to them privately didn't they deserve some sort of end to the speculation at least say like i'm gonna have to go out for six months don't they deserve a chance to compete at the top in their careers and have a proper lineup not some weird frankenstein makeshift lineup waiting for device to come back which at this point in time is like the shit of like waiting by a phone that'll never ring or just waiting for your fucking dad to come back from the gas station with cigarettes it ain't happening homie it's 20 years later like Old men robbing young guys of the prime of their careers and their opportunities. Really, bro? That's like your Astralis the Org now. Your fucking Nickel and I home. That's whack, dude. Like, unless I get more information and there's some sort of public... I can't fuck with that angle. I fuck with Device Heavy as a player. I even have mad sympathy for him with all the problems he's gone through. And like I said, I don't want Legends to leave the scene. If there's a way to work through this, no matter how long it takes, I'd want him to take it and see if he could come back and be another great player in the game or even just be a good player in the game, even just be part of a team, a role player he could even be. I think he could come back and still be one of the best players in the world and be a top five player on HLTV, etc. I think that's all possible. But it's the other implications and the inferences and, and the fact there's no real explanation of why he's just never played for an IP again. We've even heard he's playing these face it games this is months and months ago those stories started guys can't ever play for nip not even like an online game not even just to test the waters and in the meantime look yeah i get it you can't play maybe and you haven't got you can't even do some pr stuff you can't do like an interview about your career you can't come out and do fucking some documentary with them about what happened in a strat you can't do anything we can't ever get any cool angle. You don't even give them like a PR hit. And they're paying your salary, at least some of it, for these months and months and months and months. Remember, guys, if you knew how much these guys make in salary, that's like probably five times what your dad made is what device got paid to just sit and do nothing and play face it every now and then or go to some sort of, I don't know, psychologist or something. That's outrageous. Like, that's where pro players themselves don't value what the orgs do or the people who work in the orgs or the people with their teammates or how hard it is to generate that money to pay these guys to play a fucking King's Ransom to play a children's video game. Mate, I fuck with device, but again, there's some serious questions need to be asked about this.
This video was kindly supported by Ahmed Haju, Hades Good, Matt Pugnacio Rakula, Adam Oaks, Animosity, Bot Pounder 420, Jensen Gore, Kovacevic, Ord, Pacey, Tobias Bernasconi, Tosh, Tukan, and as always, a special thanks goes out to my main man, Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Would you like to ask a question in one of those monthly AMAs where sometimes I roast people? Do you want teasers to find out who the guests are for upcoming shows and interviews I'm doing? Maybe you want to be part of one of those cool, lengthy esports discussions that I have. Well, if any of those perks sound tantalizing to you, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today, where? Via the Patreon link in the description box below.